the three of Maimonides' laws of tshuva. And I mentioned at the outset that Maimonides uses this section to explore many different philosophical problems. I'm not sure exactly why he talks about free will and the foreknowledge of God and the world to come and so forth and so on. But uh, here he talks about people's spiritual performance and how it's evaluated and what its consequences are. Each and every person has merits and sins, transgressions. Gee, is that obvious? Each and every person? Does that mean that it's impossible to have a perfect record? Hmm. Why would that be? What would set it up that way? Wouldn't that be like stacking the deck? I'll get you somewhere. <laughs> You're not getting out without a loss. A little hard to understand why that would be. Now, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes, Kohelis. Ein Adam Tzadik Yechta. And yes, for those of you who know, the word Adam is there, although it's often missed out in the translation, in the, in the quotation. There's no person righteous in the earth who will do good and not fail. So that sounds like somehow fails it to be expected. There's a discussion in the Gemara and Shabbos about this. But how do we deal with a system where failing is, so to speak, built in? Now, I explained it the other day, um, I'll, and I'll go over it again. The system with failure built in could be justified if there's then a way to correct the failure. So that even though you failed, when you leave the world, you leave the world with a perfect record. It isn't like simple history where if you did it, it's there in the entropy, it contributed to the motions of all the molecules, and it's nothing to do to undo it from the past. Chuba undoes it in a certain way. So even if the system is something which failures are built in, since you can correct them and leave the world perfect, you're still responsible for doing a perfect job, or I should say better, having a perfect record. And maybe failure is something you learn from. Maybe failure is a necessary experience in a certain type of moral and spiritual development. So the Rambam is stating a fact here, and I don't think you can easily make out of the fact some kind of objection that it's not a, not a fair system. Now, a person whose merits exceed his sins is termed righteous. And the word termed here is put in as the, the translators here are very good. They put the, their uh, additions in parentheses because the word righteous or tzaddik in Hebrew has many different definitions in different contexts. So one shouldn't mistake this for the meaning of the word. It has different meanings in different contexts. But in this context, it's a matter of majority. A person whose sins exceed his merits is termed wicked. If his sins and merits are equal, he's termed benoni, which in Hebrew means in between. Same applies to an entire country. If the merits of all of its inhabitants exceed their sins, the country is called righteous. If the sins are greater, it's termed wicked. The same applies to this whole entire world. But you have the same kind of collective balance. Now, there's a tricky idea here. Because if you, let's say, have 10 people, and you talk about each person's actions, some of them are merits and some of them are sins, and you want to sum up the state of all 10, there are two different ways to do it. The way the Rambam says here is, take for person one all of his merits, and for person two all of his merits, down to 10, and put all of them on one side and count them up. We'll see that counting them up is too simplistic in a minute, but for the point of this, but then take all the, the sins of each of them and count them all up and see which number is bigger. 
That's not the only way to do it. Here's another way to do it. Take person one. If his merits are greater than his sins, call him righteous and put him in the righteous side. Now go to person two. If person two sins are greater than his, than his merits, call him wicked and put him on the wicked side and see what the majority of the people are. Not the majority of the sum total of actions, but the majority of, the, of each person. So if you have six people who are righteous and four people who are wicked, then the total of ten is called righteous. Now, if you're good at math, what's the difference between the two ways of summing it up? Sorry? The, the average versus the mean. No, it's not average versus mean. That's not what's going to do it. Here's the difference. Can the merits of one person count to outbalance the, the, the sins of a different person? No. Yeah. So on the second way of doing it, they can't. On the first way of doing it, they can. So let's, let's, take, let's take an example. Let's take an example of where um, four people ha have a majority of, of, of um, uh, merits and six people have a majority of sins. But let's say it works like this. Each of the people of the four who has a majority of merits, it means every action was a merit except one. An almost completely pure uh, um, performance. And let's suppose the six who, are, who have a majority of sins, that means that the number of sins is the number of merits plus one. Just one over half. So when you take the sins and merits of all ten, the Ramam does, you're going to have many, many, many more merits than sins. Even though the number of righteous is smaller than the right number of, of wicked people, but the sins are going to outweigh. And that means that the merits of one person can count against the performance of somebody else when you do it as a, as a sum total. That's not obvious to do it that way. I could hear another system which wouldn't work that way, but that's what the Ramam is saying. And that means that when you look, let's say, at a group, at a generation, and you try to form an estimate, you know, how, what should I think about the group? What's its status? You may have a few people in the group that have an outsized imp impact on the status of the whole because of the imbalance in their records. It could be for good and it could be for bad also. But uh, and it's very hard to know that if we're going to find out, so it would be hard to make the, the, uh, the evaluation. Um, but this means that it's really a group effort. The group status is a, is, a, is a summing up of the group effort, not just individuals in the group. And the same applies to the whole world. Now the Rama says something which is not easy to, to understand, and he cites verses to prove it. If a person's sins exceeds his merits, he will immediately die because of his wickedness. Jeremiah says, I have smitten you, I have hit you for the multitude of your generations. Now there, the word is rov, and in Hebrew, the word rov has two meanings. It can mean majority, or it can mean multitude. Here, I would, I would disagree with the translation, at least. My, my mind is taking it as the majority. <clears throat> and the country is the same thing. As it says, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and the word great there is rav, which can mean majority. In God for the entire world as well, they would immediately be destroyed. And the same thing is there. God saw the evil man was Rab, meaning great or, or, or majority. I will destroy man. So let's just take it the individual case. Hmm. So here's Harry, and he's you know living his life. And something's right and something's wrong, and he's tripping around, and the, and the, the balance is sort of shifting back and forth, maybe like a random walk. And he slips over the 50% line. According to what Maimonides says, he's going to instantly die. Well, as the Ravid, the Rambam's famous critic, critic, says, we know that that's not true. We know that there are all sorts of very, very evil people who slipped way over the line and they continue living. So he objects that simply, you look at the world, you don't see it that way. Oh, so this is an interesting, interesting thought, but the Rambam says here instantly. 
Miyad Humais, instantly. So he doesn't, he doesn't have a lot of time for that. Now, by the way, how many here have heard of the Rivet, the Rambam's critic? Nobody, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll leave out the explanation. So now, um, the Kess of Mishnah, another commentary, says the Rambam is sensitive to this problem. And in the next words, he's going to explain why it's not so simple to make such an observation. This reckoning where the majority lies is not calculated, and yes, I would, I think only is, is, not, is a fair put, thing to put in, on the basis of the number of merits and sins, but also takes into account their magnitude. The actions that people form, perform don't have equal significance, equal importance, equal magnitude, size. There are some merits which outweigh many sins. A single act, which is a merit, can outweigh, in this calculation, many failures, many transgressions. And he brings a verse which says, because in him there was found a good quality, therefore his judgment was, was favorable. In contrast, a sin may outweigh many merits. As it says, one sin may obscure much good. Aha. So now, in order to evaluate a person's record, you need to know not only what he did, but you have to evaluate what the magnitude of each action was. Well, that might depend upon what contributes to the magnitude of the action. In legal terms, there are distinctions which are open and observable. Some, for example, if you can talk about the penalty for violating the commandment, and there's a gradation of penalties. And you can say fairly that, at least in some respect, a, a, a mitzvah whose penalty is more severe is more significant, carries more weight. And that's certainly true. But it's not the end of the story. As the Rambam says, the weighing of sins and merits is carried out according to the wisdom of the knowing God. He knows how to merit, measure merits against sins. Ha! Only God can do this. Well, already, the crit critique of the Ravid, wait a minute, you say you know that there are people who have a, a greater evil record than a good record? The Rambam is saying this is something that you can't know. Now, maybe you disagree with that in the Rambam. Let's see now. What is the Rambam referring to? Well, the title that he gives to God in, this, in these words, where the translation talks about the knowing God, is Kael Deos. <coughs> Kael is the name for, one of the names for God. And Deos can mean one's beliefs, can mean one's commitments, and can mean one's character traits. In fact, in the Mishnah Torah, uh, Rambam's uh, summary of Jewish law, he has a section called Hilchos Deos, the laws of Deos, which are the laws of character traits, like generosity and miserliness and um, compassion and cruelty. That's also called Deos. And this phrase comes from a verse where Hannah, whose co-wife Penina had children and Hannah didn't have children, and Penina criticized her in bitter terms. And she claimed that she was doing it only for Hannah's good because if she doesn't have children, there's something wrong with her and she should correct it. And Hannah, when she had Samuel as her son, the great prophet Samuel, and spoke a great poetry of praise to God, said, among other things, God is a Kildeos. He knows the person's inner life. He knows the person's personality. He knows the person's emotions. He knows the person's thoughts. He can testify whether she really meant it for good or not. So the Rambam is quoting this, this t title of God, which is, I haven't done a search, but maybe the only place where, he's, where God has given this title, Kaldeos. He means to refer to that idea that the size, the magnitude of the action depends upon the psychology of the person who's performing. How much resistance was there? How difficult was it? What other com commitments did he have 
responsibility did he have that made him short of time, short of patience, short of mental space, short of inspiration? What kinds of inspirations did he receive? What kinds of obstacles did he face? <laughs> when I was becoming religious, I was an undergraduate, I decided to put on a yarmulke, and I was at Brandeis University, where the majority of the population there was Jewish. One guy said to me, who do you think you are, the Pope? Clever joke. <clears throat> but you had to have a thick skin to stand up to the kind of resistance that, that, uh, that you would face socially to do something like that. So the Rambam is saying, since we can't look into another person's soul, we can't look into his feelings, his thoughts, his hopes, his fears, his temptations, it's impossible for us to evaluate which actions are greater and which actions are less, which count more and which count less, in summing up where the greater part of his performance is on the side of merit or on the side of sin. And this is borne out, I don't know if the Rambam had this in mind when he said it, but when uh, Samuel himself, the prophet, was sent to anoint, who was in fact King David as king, and he said, God said to him, go to Yishai and tell him that one of his sons is going to be king. So he went to Yishai and said, please assemble all your sons. That's a long story, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And he had six sons plus David, and he thought David was disqualified, so he brought in the six sons. And, but Samuel hadn't been told yet which one it is. And Samuel looks at the oldest one, and the, the, the Tanakh describes how beautiful he was and how strong he was, and Samuel was, was impressed, and he thought, this is surely the one that God wants to be king. And God says to him, no, Steve, I'm disgusted with it. Very, very strong word. And then, he, then Akash Baruch Hu says to, to Shmuel, Adam, you're the Einayim. Hashem, God, you're the Levav. You see with your heart, eyes what can be seen with the eyes. God sees into the heart. Now, this is Samuel the prophet, whom the verse is compared to, to Moses and Aaron. So if Samuel the prophet is not going to see somebody else's heart, neither am I. And I hope it's not too bold, but neither are you. So when we think... How can the Rambam say that a person whose majority performance is wicked dies right away? We see people who we know their majority of their performance is wicked. Maybe we don't know that. Because we don't know how to weigh up their actions. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what background they have. And that being the case, we can't make that evaluation. But this now means that when you think of your record and when you think of what you've done and haven't done, um, this has to be a fundamental piece of your evaluation. Sometimes uh, guys come in here and they decide that they want to live a Torah life and they say, Rabbi, I'm 21 years old. Well, that means that I became responsible for my life when I was 13, eight years ago. Now, um, let's see, there are 50 Shabbos a year, so 8 times 50 would be 400, 400 Sabbaths that I didn't keep. How am I ever going to, to correct that? How am I ever going to live that down? What that question doesn't take into account is how significant was the violation of Shabbos in the condition that he was under. It may very well be that for seven out of the eight years, he didn't know what Shabbos was. He didn't know what it was for. He didn't know what it was about. That means that the status of the transgression is very, very light. If you don't know what you're doing, then you're not as responsible for it as if you did know what you were doing. And usually, in these cases, the person's not responsible for not knowing. We had one boy here who came from Pittsburgh, and he was in a conservative synagogue which meant he went twice a week to a conservative education uh, class. And one time they invited a woman to visit the class, and the teacher said, this woman is Orthodox, and she's going to ask her questions about Orthodox Judaism. So he asked, I heard that Orthodox Jews put strings on their clothes. Could you tell me about that? 
And she said, yes, they're called tzitzis, and they put them on four-cornered garments, and uh, it's written in the Torah and in certain verses, and nobody does that anymore. Okay, nobody does it anymore. No, nope. nobody does it. Then he's not going to go and try to do it or investigate it because nobody does it. Of course, it was an out and out lie <laughs> because even at that time, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were putting on tzitzis. So he's not responsible for his ignorance, and because he did it in ignorance, the whole, the whole sense of the transgression is, is very, very reduced. It could be that the fact that he, that he starts making blessings before he eats outweighs all of those failed Sabbaths. Because he's doing something new now, and he's breaking with his social milieu, and his friends are going to ask him what he's doing, and that requires effort, has to overcome resistance. So, that being the case, that will be very significant, and the 400 failed Shabbosos will be insignificant. So that's the, that's the idea that you have to, have to take into account. Yeah. That the, it's the, the significance of the actions that, that makes the difference. Now, not only can't I see into your heart, but although the Rambam doesn't say it directly, but it's true, you can't look into your own heart either. Because we're not, even if we knew <coughs> abstractly the dimensions of the, of the significance of the action, we're not unbiased on our, on our, own, can't, on our own case. The Gemara puts it this way, relatives can't give testimony uh, uh, concerning one another, and a person is his own relative. <laughs> no closer can you get than that. Now, here, the problem is that we have all sorts of emotional connections with where we are and who we are, and they distort our vision both ways. Not just to be more lenient than, than true in our own case, but sometimes more severe than true in our own case. I know a person who lived in a situation where someone related to him used to criticize him bitterly, and he internalized it. And he came to think of himself as really bad. And then, when, and, and he happens to have good qualities. He isn't perfect, but he has good qualities. And then when another person befriended him, the thought in his mind is, what's wrong with him that he wants to be my friend? Because I'm garbage. Why would he want to be friends with me? And then he said, you know, part of me realizes that that thought is crazy, but I can't get it out of my head. I've been told I'm garbage for so long. I, I, can't, I can't just dismiss it. So imagine a person who doesn't have the right information and he thinks he is garbage. That's terrible. And it's wrong. It's wrong. So a person can't even evaluate his own case. And this fact is the explanation for an idea which is written about in, in, in a number of different sources. What is humility? Some people associate humility with the idea that I'm really nothing special. I'm not better than anybody else. I'm nothing special. Well, um, the Boshachan Mutsato in the Mesilis Ashorim, Path of the just doesn't define it that way. He defines it this way. A humble person who is a person who says, I am not worthy of praise for my great qualities. And a proud person is one who says, I am worthy of praise for my great qualities. Which means they both believe they have great qualities, and when they differ is their attitude towards those great qualities which means a person who thinks he's nothing isn't humble. And he's not proud. He's nothing. He's not on the scale. And part of the attitude here is when a poster, which I saw, the picture on the poster is uh, an, a, a kid, let's say, eight years old, with a frown on his face. And the legend is, I know I'm somebody because God don't make junk. 
Yeah, that's true. You are somebody. Because God doesn't make junk. God gives you and arranges that you should develop good qualities. <coughs> so if you think you have no good qualities, you're just wrong about yourself. And we don't praise that. So how then does a person who has great qualities come to the position that he doesn't deserve praise for it? Here's the way I, when I first faced the problem, here's the way I put it to myself. Let's imagine Moses. The Torah says Moses was the humblest of all people. Humblest of all people. Now let's imagine Moses getting up in the morning and thinking, who am I? I'm the one who engineered uh, leading the people out of Egypt. And I'm the one who brought the Torah down from heaven to the Jewish people. And I'm the one who prepared them for and was the intermediary in the revelation at Sinai. And I'm very humble. How does he manage that? Does he have to lie to himself? Not, not be conscious of his own greatness? When, they, when the people make the golden calf and Moses comes down from the mountain and he's carrying the tablets that God gave him, he smashes the tablets, he burns and grinds the uh, golden calf into powder and forces them to drink the water uh, from the mountain. And then he says, whoever has not participated in the golden calf, come to me. And then he says, those who, who worship the golden calf as an idol have to be killed. They should be executed. That doesn't sound like someone who says, don't ask me, who, who am I? How could I make a judgment? I can't take control. We leave it to other people. Let's make a committee. We can all get together and discuss it. But me, he took very drastic action on his own. And yet he's called the humblest of all people. So Lutzata says, humility is not taking credit for the great qualities that you have. How do you do that? So the Pritzadik, a great uh, Hasidic philosopher, quotes a Gemara and Tanis and explains it as follows. Gemara and Tanis says that one of the Talmudic sages was in the market, and he observed the person, and he said out loud, look how ugly he is. And he didn't mean just he had an ugly face. He meant he was an ugly person. So, the Talmud says, the person overheard him and came over to him and said, you say I'm ugly? Go to the craftsman that made me. Well, the commentaries say that this person who had this ugly appearance was really Elijah the prophet. And he was sent to elicit this response from this, this sage so that he should get this rebuke. Now the question is, What's the rebuke? If he has bad qualities, then what do you mean, go to the craftsman that made me? Is God responsible for those qualities? And says the Pritzadik, yes. And here's how he understands the rebuke. Rabbi, when you get out of bed in the morning, what's your goal for the day? Your goal is to have a perfect day, or a 99% day. <coughs> That's your goal. Why? Because your parents were great people, and your grandparents were great people, and you went to a great yeshiva, and you're surrounded by the leaders of the generation, and all that influence in you gave you very great qualities, and now the interval in which you operate and, and, and make an effort is a very high interval because you were placed on a high pedestal to start with. But my parents were ordinary people, and my surroundings were ordinary, and I grew up with an ordinary background, and my goal for the day is to be decent. Not 99%, but decent. Now, you're struggling to reach your goal, and I'm struggling to reach my goal. Who says your struggle is any dearer to God than mine? Okay. So what counts is the struggle. And in fact, in the way of God by Lutzato, he says three times, you get credit only for your effort, your hishtabas. The deep reason is because the outcome is due to God, not, not, due, not due to you. But at any rate, that means that the struggle is what determines what, the, what, what you have merit, what your merit and your credit. And that's what we can't see in the other person. We see the person's performance. We don't see the person's insides. So Moses says, sure, I have outstanding qualities, maybe qualities that no one else ever will have. 
but look, my father was the, great, was the leader of the previous generation, and my mother was a great saint. And I grew up in the palace of the emperor and had a king's education. Look at the pedestal that Coach Baruch put me on. Wouldn't you expect superb performance from somebody with a background like that? So I don't deserve any more credit for my superb performance than the average person may, may deserve for his, for his performance. And that's why the Rambam says, if we get to it in chapter 5, he says that because we are given free will, every person could be equally tzaddik, equally righteous as Moses. And you think, come on, I would never reach Moses' level. Moses' level in what? Moses' level in prophecy? It's guaranteed not to happen. Moses' level in knowing all of the Torah? Chances are you just don't have the capability of doing that. So what do you mean Moses' level? Moses' level in righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is what you've earned. It's the merit that you've earned. I could make as big an effort as he made. He made a gigantic effort with all his, with all his strength. I could also make a method effort with all my strength. That I could do. If I do that, I'll be sitting next to him in Ghanaian. So that's, the, that's the, the idea that you can't know, even in your own case, because you don't know how much of what you accomplish is really due to your own effort, as a response to your own effort, the divine response, and how much is, is, is what was, what was inve invested in you. And therefore, we have to admit ignorance across the board. And therefore, typically, all these rules have exceptions, but typically, we don't judge people, we judge actions. Because we can judge the legality or illegal illegality of an action, that's a question of according to rules that are public. But to, to judge the status of the person, we're not we're not able to do that. Questions up to you. So kind of just to simplify uh, what you were saying about like in an example of Moshe Rabbeinu being like you know this very humble but also amazing person, is it kind of this idea of taking like the ego out of the equation? To a certain extent, that's definitely true. I'm not sure it goes all the way to the end. But uh, the example that I give is this. Let's imagine that IBM uh, makes an advertisement. We're looking for 10 people who are, ex who are um, exceptional in programming. And we're, we're starting a new project, which is very high. There's a secret to cover a project and everything else. And we want excellent programmers. And we are going to have an open competition Monday morning. You can log in, and we have a, a programming problem. And you can try to program, and oh, as many thousands of people that there are, and the best programs will be hired. So they give the problem, and then when you write the program, then they have diagnostics running, so, which give you results and say, here's where it's going to go into a loop, or here's where it's going to fail, or this isn't defined, and then you fix it and try to uh, make it a better program. OK, the end of the week, 10 people get the thing in the, in the mail. Report next Monday, you're the 10 chosen ones. And those 10, when they finished with their program and with the diagnostics, they had running programs. Of course, that doesn't make them ideal. They could be more efficient programs, but they had running programs. So they come in and, uh, Monday morning, and the person responsible them says, listen, you're chosen. You were the best out of the thousands that did it. I just want to let you in on a little secret. None of your programs ran. None of them. We gave you false results. When we said it ran and we wanted it to run faster, whatever it is, we gave you false feedback. It wasn't really what your program produced. Because we wanted you to take the next step to test something else about you. So in fact, they didn't run. But you're very good. I think you'd be a little deflated, right? I mean, like, oh, so it didn't really work. My efforts were good, but it didn't really work. Now, we have a situation that's similar to that. Because we say, what you have under your control is your efforts, but the outcome you don't control. It's not under your control. The outcome is a gift from God. He sets you a task. He observes your performance, so to speak, and says, okay, this is what you did. This is the next step in the chain. You get this, and now you have to deal with this. So that reflection definitely reduces the ego. Definitely reduces the ego. Um, it has other implications as well. So I think it's a good observation. Well, there are more things going on just than that, but it's a good observation. Any other questions? Yes. So I, I have a question about, so there is a teaching that uh, Adam Harishon had a collective soul, 
and when he sinned, the different parts of his soul uh, fell onto, into the realm of the impurity, other souls fly upward, they were uh, not uh, infected by the impurities, and every people uh, inherits some part of this collective soul, and some soul is uh, completely rectified, and other soul is blemished. <coughs> and uh, it uh, defines how a people will behave. So, for example, Moshe received a completely pure soul, and for example, Korach received a soul which has a blemish. But in this respect, nobody can, can be con condemned for his sins because somebody receive a good soul, somebody receive a blemish soul. So it's not exactly their sin. This is the precondition of them. No? I have never heard of such a teaching. I do not believe that it's a Jewish teaching. Uh, the Rambam himself says in the Moran the Bukhim that's something that no one ever questioned, that we have free will. Because we have free will, we are responsible for what we do. And he says no one ever questioned that. So I'd be very, very surprised to hear that. If you take it and just reduce it, and that is to say souls have different qualities, which means that we have different positive impulses that we can use to do the right thing and different negative impulses to overcome so that our challenges are different, that could be true. Okay. That probably is true. But that's not the same as saying that Korah got a, a soul which determined that he will sin. That's certainly not. Okay. That's certainly not. Even Esau, for those who know a little bit, was not pre-programmed to fail. He could, have, he could have done the right thing. And that's why he has responsibility for what he's doing. Your, your logic is right. If that were true, then we wouldn't be responsible for what we do. Rambam says that also. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. That's. That section. Now the Rambam goes on with another thought. Anyone who changes his mind about the mitzvot that he has performed and regrets the merits he has earned, saying in his heart, what value was there in doing them? I wish I hadn't performed them. Loses them all. And no merit is preserved for him at all. As it says, the righteousness of the upright will not save him on the day of his transgression. That doesn't mean any old transgression, but this is, um, as the Rambam says now, this only applies to one who regrets his previous deeds. Not that he does another transgression. Let's say he keeps kosher and he studies Torah, and then uh, later on he violates Shabbos. He's not going to lose credit for uh, being kosher and 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 and. and, and uh, and, keep, and uh, studying Torah. But if the transgression at the end is, I wish I hadn't done it, then yes, it can, it can, um, it can undo that, that merit. Now, let's try to put this in context a little bit. And then maybe we'll do what the Rukhaman Basim he asked a question about this. Let's think, we're talking about chuba now. What's the general idea of chuba? person does something wrong, there's a way to avoid responsibility for and liability for what he did. If a person does tshuva, that enables him to escape any negative consequences, <coughs> well, let me say, let me, any punishment for what he did. So even though the action is in the, in the history book, it is in the history book, but the normal outcome of that action won't apply to him. Because he's changed himself. He's in a different condition now. One way of saying this is the Rambam's way of saying it. And this we saw. That is, you change your name as if to say, I'm not the person who did it. Did that fire get lit on Shabbos? Yeah, I guess it did. I remember that. That's right. Well, you're guilty. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was somebody else. My twin brother. You know, it's just, <laughs> I'm on a different track now. That means by changing your present condition, you can change your relationship to the past event. What we're being told now is that it works both ways. It works positively. You can avoid responsibility for a failure. And it works negatively. You can lose merit for a success. When you regret it, it's as if to say, it doesn't fit my present mental set. 
according to my mind, if I had been there like this, I wouldn't have done it. Well, then it doesn't fit you anymore. It's not part of your kit, as the British would say. It's not part of what's, what relates to you. You've canceled your relationship to that thing in the past. Just like when you do tshuva for a failure, you're not related to that thing in the past. That's the Rambam's position. So we do have a kind of parallelism here. And I think, you know, if it's a fair system, and it's dependent upon how we mold our identities, you can mold it positively and you can mold it negatively. The Bukhara Masaran points out that this, this description, when you compare it with the description of what you have to do for tshuva, it sounds like tshuva is much harder than this. Let's go back and review what the definition of tshuva is. Tshuva requires, number one, abandoning the previous bad behavior. That meant stopping to do it and putting it out of your mind and resolving never to go back to it. And regretting it. And confessing to God that you've abandoned it and you regret it. And when you do all three, then that's tshuva and you don't get any responsibility for what happened in the past. <clears throat> Here, it sounds like to lose the merit of the good actions, all you have to do is regret it. That's all. Where's the idea of changing your behavior? Not mentioned. Certainly no declaration <laughs> has to be made. So here you have one out of three. Now we have a general rule in the Torah that going up is easier than going down. Good things come more easily than bad things. Because Baruch was biased on the side of good. It says that if people are good in a certain way, God remembers it for 2,000 generations. And if people are bad in a certain way, he remembers it for four generations. For which the Talmud says, you see, the side of good outweighs the side of bad 500 to 1. So why would it be that disconnecting from a failure, which is making a good move, is hard, requires all three conditions, versus disconnecting from a success, which is a bad move, is much easier. Doesn't sound like it's, a, it's appropriate. So the Chana Masterman says, and this will give us some deeper idea into what's, what's really going on. When a person performs a transgression, at least two different things are going on. One is disobedience. Because Baruch was said to do X, he's not doing X. It's rebellion against God. It's a disconnect from God's will. Disconnect in a certain sense from a certain relationship with God. We talked about that. We talked about Shubham. You're returning, returning to where you were at one time. But also, the ecologists will be happy with this. When you live in the world, the things you do have effects on the world. You know, a person is burning his leaves in the fall in Maine, and uh, they come up to him with a fire hose, and you can't do that. Who are you to tell me what I'm doing on my property? I'm burning my leaves on my property. Go away. You're polluting the atmosphere. Atmospheric, atmospheric. Leave me alone. I'm burning my leaves on my property. Leave me alone. So what do you do? You put out his leaves. Why? Because he's doing something in the atmosphere. Really, what we do is connected. The thing that we do in one place have an effect on other things. Aerosols. All those gases which cleverly run to the South Pole to make a hole in the ozone layer. So, Rabbi Chaim Rasman says, we know that we are connected to the spiritual underpinnings of reality, and when we perform actions, those actions have an effect on the way in which, to put it in one, one dimension, the divine energy flows into the world. And when you do a mitzvah, you promote that divine flow. And when you do a transgression, you impede that divine flow. And that's a real effect on the world. So in order to escape, the, fully escape the, um, the effects of the failures in your, on your record, you have to repair both of them. So by uh, committing oneself to be faithful to the Torah in the future, you're correcting the failure of disconnecting yourself from God's will. Okay, I, 
opposed his will, from now I'm going to do his will. But how do you affect the um, destruction that you, that, you, that you caused in the world? I'm getting, I'm getting it backwards. I'm sorry. The regret. The regret that you have for doing it is where you now <coughs> say, I'm, in, 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 I'm consistent with God's will. And by changing your behavior, you correct the effect it had on the spiritual structure of the world. So each half of tshuva addresses a different part of the failure. This is a part of the, of the destruction of the failure. Here, all he loses is his merit for his obedience. His regret in doing the, uh, doing the mitzvah disconnects him from the reward he would have had for his obedience. He can't undo the constructive effects for the world. That he can't do. He doesn't have it, he doesn't have it in his hands to do that. If he did mitzvahs, and at the time he wanted to do them, did them sincerely, and that greased the flow of the divine energy into the world, that grease is still there. He can't undo that. So this only takes away the merit that he would have of obedience. And that's why it's only merit, it's only regret, because that's the only part that it, that it affects. So that at least makes the disconnection from a failure, disconnection from a, from a success parallel. And it isn't easier to lose than it is to win. That, that, uh, that's the way Rabbi Khan Basma answers the question. But now you begin to see what's going on when you, when you, when you perform an action. An action has lots of consequences, and the consequences may not all be apparent at, uh, at the outset. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yona talks about regret, and he says regret is a lifelong process. And uh, the way it's explained is like this. Let's say you're in a business, and you have a partner. Business has ups and downs. That goes through a down period. And uh, after about a year, your partner says, listen, I have to confess something to you. Um, we went through a down period. That's because I was stealing from the business. I was guilty of fraud. I was stealing from the business. And I'm very sorry. I regret it. And I will, I'm giving you back the money. Now suppose the partner says, gee, sorry to hear that you did it. I'm happy to hear that you regret it. I'd be happy to have the money, but let me tell you something. I have a problem. I'm addicted to gambling. And I was in re uh, rehabilitation, and I got control of it. And my wife said, okay, I'm happy you got control of it, but never again. If you do it again, I'm leaving you. Over the last six months, we didn't have enough money. She said to me, I see you're back to gambling. I said, I'm not. She didn't believe me. She left me. Oh, so the one who stole the money caused the divorce. Yeah, but you see, the divorce was six months ago, and without a mother in the house, the children are suffering. Our children need psychological help, and they need, they're need they having trouble in school. Oh, so the children are suffering. How far does this go? How far do the consequences go? Well, you don't know. Maybe next year the kid will kill, will kill somebody. You don't know. Regret is a lifelong process because you come to understand much better as life goes on the effect of what you do. You come to appreciate this secondary uh, impact of what you do. So this is also true for the good consequences of what you do. There's a, a statement that when a person dies, there's a certain judgment of his life. But then there's another judgment at the end of this period of history, when the resurrection takes place, there's another judgment. So they ask, what do you need another judgment for? Yeah, his life was judged when he died. The answer is this. He put things in the world, let's say children. Well, he put them in the world, he trained them, he inspired them. When they go on to act, part of the merit of what they do accrues to him because he trained them in that way. And he inspired them in that way, which means his record isn't finished until all the consequences run out. Now, 
if you know about entropy, you will think, okay, that'll take a while, but surely in a few generations they'll run out. But if you know about chaos theory, you know that's not true. Any tiny change can put an indelible mark by causing a gigantic change because we live in a nonlinear system. If you don't know about that and you're interested in hearing about it, I'll explain it to you. So that's why you have to wait until the end of history because the consequences of what you do may not play out until the end of history. And these consequences can be good. You can accumulate a great deal of merit by the people you interact with, principally your children, but your students if you teach and your friends, your colleagues, uh, and the influence that you have will cause effects, and all those effects have to be taken into account in evaluating a person's life. And God's judgment of a person's life is what's happened up, of, up until now. He doesn't use his knowledge of the future to make that judgment. That's another situation. We could discuss why that is, but that, that's, that's the fact. Similarly, says Rabbi Yonu, but he doesn't make the connection. I'm making the connection. Similarly, regret, as you live life and you say, that's what I did, oh, but I realize now that doing that could cause this because I learned something about life or I learned something about, about uh, medicine or whatever it is. <coughs> and I don't know. Uh, and th so this is the connectedness of life. That's, that, that, those effects are in the world in physical terms, in psychological terms, and in spiritual terms, and those effects you have no control over. So with respect to, to um, mitzvos, all you can do is detach yourself from the credit that you earn from following God's will. That's what regret does. But the other part isn't under your control. Yeah? Um, for regret, and just trying to change the scenario a little bit of the one you presented, where, where the, the two business partners, one is stealing, and then his, his, he comes and, and confesses the stealing to, his, to the other partner who now tells him all of the repercussions that the stealing had. But what if it's, how do you know when, when the regret should be yours or when it's something to regret? Maybe, maybe the business partner went to, went to him and said, oh, you know, I knew about your gambling problem and I know that, and now I'm confessing to you this, but the business partner says, no, you know, I, my wife and I got divorced for all of these other reasons, but like in the back of your mind, you feel it really was you. Well, I think you're raising a, an important question that often we don't have good answers to. Um, what causes what? in the world generally, and certainly in psychological matters, is very difficult to, to, to pull out. Um, I have a proof that it's very difficult. The proof is that there are at least 10 different schools of psychology which analyze it in different ways. And wh you know, what's worse than having no answer to a question is having 10 answers to a question. Because for each answer, you have nine answers saying the other one's wrong. Um, so it's very, very complicated to know. Now, you could do it, you know, as like a failsafe. You say, I don't know the extent to which what I did contributed, but for whatever extent it is, I regret it. I feel bad about it. And you, and you could do it in those kind of open-ended terms. And that would be fine. Yeah. Um, so I've heard Jerome Krauss say that a couple of times, that if the next war was, you know, you destroy the world by, you know, making it easy to take it down. How do you, you, you said, you were explaining how to correct them, but um, you, you were saying, are you saying by doing good, it's, we're correcting the bad that we've no. done, or there's no way to really correct No, it? no, the, uh, I was quoting the Rambam, I wasn't quoting the Rambam okay. on this, and the Rambam says that when you do tshuva, it becomes as if you aren't the person who did that. So it sits there. The evil sits there in the world. But there's no real way to really correct that. I didn't say that either. I just said what the Rambam says about tshuva, particularly, is that the evil sits in the world, and I'm disconnected from it. I'm disconnected from it, and I don't I suffer any consequences, any, any punishment for it. There may be other consequences, because I may have injured myself in certain ways, but I... I, 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 I that destruction just sits there. But it's not a question of, 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 correcting, uh, of correcting that. And, and even when you hear about what the Hebrew is called, tikkun achet, I think you have to be very careful about it. I, I'll, I'll end with this, because it's a slightly sophisticated legal idea. Um, I'll, I'll share it with you, and if you're still puzzled about it tomorrow. I'll, I'll explain it in, in greater detail. Let's say an action happened in the past. There are certain ways in which you can affect that action. The word in Hebrew is lemafreya. Lemafreya means retroactively. 
retroactive. But in lambdas, there are two different types of retroactively. One type of retroactively is that action happened a year ago. And that action, the way it's designed, has consequences. And I'm going to go back in time, time travel, and I'm going to switch off those consequences at the source. So that in the interim, it was a mistake. We thought the consequences were there, but they really weren't there. Because, because what I'm doing now, I'm shutting off those consequences at the source. That's one possibility. That's called the mafreya. The other possibility is it's, action was what it was, and it's designed to produce consequences, and the consequences are flowing forward. But from now on, that action in the past will no longer have those consequences. That's called mikanala haba mafreya. It retroactively deprives the event of the possibility of affecting the future, but doesn't erase the consequences that it had in the meantime. How do you get to that point? So that's the easier point to get to, because you can change your relationship to the, uh, to the event so that the way that the, 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 um, the consequences flow, they don't affect you anymore. It's sort of like water flowing, making everything wet, and then encasing, encasing everything in plastic. OK. You can case them in plastic also. I mean, you know, there's no end to the kinds of details that you could. I'm just pointing out that there are two different ways to understand what happens when you reach into the past and shut it off. And uh, for example, if someone acquires a piece of property, and there's a way of Working in the past, this is what they do with Kedushin, right? You, you, you can invalidate the act in the past, or do you change the character of the act in the past? There's a ca certain case where people get married, and for whatever reason, it later is determined that they shouldn't be married, and they invalidate the marriage. So they weren't married the whole time. That's real, my friend. You change the past. The, whole, the, legal, this legal, the legal status of the past. Um, the other way is to detach yourself from the consequences of the past. Now, um, I can't think of a good example of that. You know, Gittin doesn't do that, it just ends the marriage. Um, yeah, this is the, this is the machlekes. Suppose you, uh, p people give testimony and it's later discovered that they're lying. Well, discovered. There are certain conditions under which the court rules that they're lying. This is where the Machlechus comes up, Rav and Abai on, on Edim Zomer. Um, so the rule, court rules that they're lying. Let's see. Let's say that they gave the testimony in January, and it's now May. And uh, something happens in May, and May says, okay, we now know that the, the witnesses were lying in January. What happens to any legal actions they performed in between? Suppose they signed a contract in March. Signing a contract is witnessing the contract. Is the signature valid? Isn't it valid? Yeah. It's much like the Sumdura. Rabban Abai. There's a difference of opinion. So here's exactly what it means. Because the decision that the court makes, that they're liars, is based on a legal rule, not on a proof of lying, but on a legal rule. The legal rule may be simply a rule of law. This is what you must do. If it's a legal rule only, then it starts when the rule is invoked. The rule was invoked in May. That's when they declared them to be liars. OK, so for now, I'm going to take them as liars. If there's a logic to it, then you can project it back to, the time, to January when they gave the false testimony. And this is a machlokist, the, um, the, the tour says that it's a legal rule. But it has, it has an explanation, a legal explanation. And I saw in Rav Hirsch that it, that it doesn't have an explanation. So maybe I'm getting, I'm getting those, those two mixed up. But anyway, it is a machlikis in the Gemara. And it's a machlikis, uh, uh, I mean, it's an explanation of Mishan and Akron and how it's supposed to work. So there's a good example. What's the legal status between January and May? And one way, it, you go back to the January and say, they were liars in January, and everything they did from then on was invalid. That's real in Afreya. And the other is, because we have declared them liars in January, from May on, we'll treat them as, January, as, as liars. That's Mikan Lahabal, my friend.
that's a, a good example of how, of how that works. So when you're talking about tshuva, you're talking about uh, getting rid of responsibility for the past, typically it's from now on, the consequences of that, uh, that action don't apply to me anymore. But it doesn't change the fact that it had the consequences for me beforehand, and, I, and certain things could have happened to me in between before I did tshuva because of it. And it doesn't make those things that happened to me invalid or inappropriate. Divine providence may have treated me in such a way because I did that action, and now that I've done tshuva, it's not going to be retroactive that divine providence shouldn't have treated me that way or didn't treat me that way, not undoing the past. So it's only me kind of a habit, my friend, not, not the other. Yeah, question? No? Yeah. Um, so when it talks about regretting uh, doing a mitzvah, say you do a mitzvah and you feel great about it, but that mitzvah and the person that you helped out ends up being a very bad person and doing very bad things. So you find yourself regretting helping them out. So first of all, you're making a philosophical mistake. You did right. You should be proud of what you did right. And the fact that these are the consequences, that's called divine providence. That's what he wanted because of the way in which he's running the world. It's not as if you really did something bad. No, it's really good. And if you really did it because you now think you see that what you did was bad, you're not regretting a mitzvah. You think now that it wasn't a mitzvah. That's not regretting a mitzvah. No, the rule book said to do it, and God said to do it, and I should have played ball instead of it. Just made a mistake in following, the, following what God wanted. Shouldn't have done it. That's what it's got to be. It's got to be vicious like that. Okay, we have more to finish in this thing. If you can save the papers, although.